computer-aided language learning and educational management, has been an academic director of various English institutes, is the general coordinator of the Language School of APEC University, founder of the School of Languages at Universidad Católica Tecnológica de Ciudad, director of the Advanced Program for Teachers of English Language, creator of the Productive Bilingual High School Program for the Dominican Ministry of Education, has been the executive director of Dominican Republic TESOL from 2014 to 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, Juan Valdez. Hello, one, two, three. That's like the introduction to the book. It's amazing. I've never been to a TESOL in three years with so many special friends. It's great. Well, as I say, my name is Juan Valdez. I don't even drink coffee. <laughs> I didn't know the words of one of this coffee until I came here last month. It's my first time during this year, and I love it. I'd like to thank uh, Colombia TESOL on behalf of the Dominican Republic TESOL for having me here today, and I'd like to thank all of you as well for being present. I've been in the field of English language teaching for 30 years now. I've been a director, a teacher, a researcher. I've been into unions school associations, parental associations, but always around English language teaching. After 20 years working in private institutions, working with the elite institutions in my country, which I actually direct one of them, which is St. Lawrence Bilingual Schools, I began to worry about the fact that in my country, and the rest of Latin America, public school students don't get to learn English. Then I started wondering why that was the many factors into it. So I'd like to begin this presentation giving you 15 seconds, I'm gonna count it, to tell the person next to you why you think it is that English is not learned in public education. 15 seconds. Turn to the person next to you, why? Oh, okay. <laughs> you can tell we can. Sign up. Sign up. Sign up. Just a quick idea. Just a quick thought. Just want to get to know exactly what is the first thing or the first two things that come to mind. My research is at three levels of inquiry to try to find the answer to this question. Why? Because as of today, 90% of the students in Latin America are condemned to monolingualism. 90% of the people in Latin America go to public education. At least most of the countries in Latin America travel to and be in touch with don't get public school education to work. In terms of English language learning, that is. You think about countries like the US, and it's even worse. In the, U in the US, second language learning school, it's worse than English language learning in Latin America. They're monolingual. And this has huge economic, social consequences, which we, as English language teachers, have to address. When you ask somebody why English is not learned in public schools, the first thing that comes to their minds is the teacher. We don't have good teachers. Teachers are not well trained. Or the students. Well, our students don't like English. And I have found that to be totally wrong. I had that belief myself, coming from the private sector and going into public education many years ago. <coughs> it wasn't until I went inside public schools that I got to understand that the problem was not simply the teacher, which is only one individual, or the students, which supposedly didn't like English at all. So let's go through it and you'll understand First of all, let's try to understand what's been going on in Latin America for the last 20 years. All the countries in Latin America for the last 20 years have tried to solve this problem. And they have all implemented different programs to address the issue, which most of them have failed. My research is based on three different pieces. First of all, my own research in 2013, entitled Why the English is Not Learning Latin American Public Schools. After that, the British Council had some research called English in Latin America. And a couple of years ago, 
the Inter-American Dialogue produced another piece of research called English and Latin American Countries. So I took the three pieces of research for the last 10 years, including mine, to try to solve the puzzle. The first problem is that when you ask about English language learning in Latin America, the issue is reduced to an individual approach. Teacher or students. And most people don't understand the macro of education. How education actually works, which is not basically about one subject or one individual. Just like society, for society to work, you have three levels of impact. Education has the same thing. Dr. Camarada Nivello, in his book, The Young Methods, refers to this as well. What I mean by this is the following. At the micro level, at the macro level we have policy making. The factors of national policies and also interest groups, economic interest groups. Does Latin America really want a well-educated citizenry? No. In my opinion, they don't. Interest groups in Latin America don't want citizens to have a better education. It's not what they want. It's too dangerous. Also, educational policy accounts for 40% of the problem. Without the right policies, you may have the best trained teachers, and they will have very little impact. At the second level, the meso level, you have contextual factors. Community, sociocultural factors, program management factors, teaching resources, work conditions, and professional associations as well. We, TISOs, are we TISOs in Latin America doing the job? Are we playing the role that our country, not our profession, needs? It's a serious problem. Because the ELT problem has been reduced to an individual problem. As if it were a problem of professional development. And most institutions only focus on that, on the individual, not on the macro of education. And taking into account the Latin American reality, it's very hard to solve any academic problem from an individual standpoint. <laughs> then we have the micro level. Teachers, which in my opinion don't account for more than 30% of the problem. And of course, teacher development and evaluation. I say this from experience. I'm going to pose the idea in my country. I have teachers with PhDs in public schools from Europe, from the US, in a standard public school. Teachers who have no impact despite having the best training in the world. Can an individual actually solve the issue of not learning English in public education? In our experience, that's not been the case. So I went through an examination of English language teaching and learning programs, policies, and professional associations and priorities in the region. First of all, teaching, of course, is important. The learning programs as well, the policies, the professionals, and the priorities. If we don't see this issue as a macro, it will be very hard to square. I mean, it will be an impossible circle to square. I analyze the policies and realities in Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Chile, Peru, Uruguay, and Panama, including the Dominican Republic, too. I went through the realities in all these countries. The first conclusion we came to was that without a well-developed policy framework, it is hard to solve the problem of teaching and learning English. I know, and I ask you, you as a teacher, you as a professional association, how much incidence do you have in policy making? Are you taking into account? Because you are the experts. Who is making the decisions on policy? The experts or the politicians and interest groups? So let's, let's be honest. If we really want to solve the problem of learning English in public education, you, without you, in policy making and decision making, it is impossible because they lack the expertise. And they may even lack the interest. So when we think about teachers, professional development, well, without the right policies, people forget that education doesn't happen in vitro. Education happens, comes about in vivo. There is a context, there is a whole world around it, a whole ecosystem of which teachers is just one small component. Now, this is a framework developed on the Inter-American Dialogue of Research 
that states that in order to achieve English language learning in public education, first we need a strong legal foundation. It must be a law. It must be made a law. A strong law. Not a strategy, not a policy. Because policies and strategies are changed government by government. So we need a strong legal foundation. We need good standards and support for learning. Many countries have told me, Juan, we have new standards for teachers. Great. Now I wonder, are you giving teachers the required support to reach those standards? Most countries don't. They only go as far as demanding better performance for teachers, but do not provide teachers with the conditions to reach the standards. Measurements of student achievement. There are countries in Latin America that have been having, having programs for 20 years, for 15 years, without any evaluation of learning, any assessment of learning at all, for years. Millions and millions of dollars in programs, and they never get to measure learning, teacher learning and student learning, independently, not by the institutions that do the programs. The same institution that sells the program cannot be the institution to evaluate results. That's impossible, that's what's been happening. And finally, measurement of teacher qualifications. Yes, teachers are part of the equation, but just part of it. But they should not only be measured. Before you measure teacher competence, you have to provide teacher training. And the problem with most English programs in Latin America is that they begin by assessing teachers, measuring teacher learning. That creates a bias, and that's the issue, because you need to understand the culture in Latin America. If you really want to solve the problem in public education at the English level, the first thing you need to know is the context. The mentality of the people in public education. And that they need a different approach. In terms of these ideas, this is a state of the art in Latin America. In all these countries, you could see over here we have a check mark which means this topic has been successfully addressed. We have a rumbus that says there has been some progress, and you have an X that says that adequate conditions do not yet exist in these countries. Let's think about Colombia, because I'm not going to take any other country, about any other country now. In Colombia, for example, as of the moment of this research, English was not mandatory by law. There is not a law in Colombia, Colombia that states a program for it. There is a policy, it is in the curriculum, but it's not by law. There is a national strategy. In fact, I was talking to Rosita, and Rosita told me that there's been a program since 2004. There's been an English program for 15 years. So that's, some, that's important. There's been a program. However, how has the program been developed? Standards for learning. Colombia does have standards for learning. It provides teaching support, at least in theory including curriculum and programs of study. In, in terms of student achievement, there are standards here in Colombia for student achievement. There are proficiency goals, there is proficiency assessment. In terms of teacher proficiency standards, well, we have an issue here, because we still don't have the right conditions according to this research. Proficiency goals, we do, but there is no proficiency assessment for teachers. So, the same reality happens all over Latin America. We don't have a strong legal foundation. Standards for learning may be developed, but they're not followed up on. Student achievement is not monitored, at least not effectively, and teacher qualifications are an issue. Let's see it one by one. 64% of English class is mandatory in Latin America. At least in 64% of countries, English is mandatory. And there is a national plan or strategy in 46% of the country. Look, this is a list of all the English programs that are well known in Latin America. You have Chile, Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Mexico, Panama, Peru, Uruguay, and the Dominican Republic. Since 2004, we've had English programs in Latin America without success. All these programs. In terms of standards for learning, 73% of, uh, of the countries have learning standards with clear objectives. However, only 46% of these countries provide effective teacher support for their curriculum and programs of study. How do you invest millions in an English program 
and then not give support to teachers on site, school by school. <coughs> That's been going on all over Latin America. It's like a fad. English is in fashion for governments and politicians, but it's just propaganda. It's good to say, Colombia bilingue. Wow, it sounds great. Is that a fact? Panama bilingue. Sounds funny, though. sounds great. Student achievement, 64% of standards for measuring student achievement exist in Latin America, but only 73% of the countries have clear student proficiency goals. In terms of teacher qualifications, 55% of these countries have standards for teacher proficiency. But I have a question, why do you have standards for teacher proficiency and then don't work with them? You do have the standards, but they're just a piece of paper. 73% of the teachers of the countries have teacher proficiency goals. But what are the channels, the conditions created for these to actually work? How do they work? They don't. 28% of these countries have proficiency assessment for teachers. And that's a problem. Imagine, in Colombia you have 70, over 70,000 English teachers. But only 28% of them actually go through proficiency assessment. That is serious. In my country, it's even worse. Now, this evaluation of the English language learning and teaching policy frameworks of Latin America demonstrates a series of weaknesses in designing and implementing effective English language learning and teaching programs within their schooling systems. And I guess the main issue here is that most programs don't understand the nature of schooling. For example, some of us work in universities, others work in institutes, and others work in bilingual schools, so-called bilingual schools. But a public school is a totally different animal. And when people go to college, they are not taught, to become teachers that is, how to work in public school, because there's not such a thing. So we have to take into account the nature of these programs when we address program implementation. And the biggest weakness in these programs is actually program implementation. The right conditions for programs to be successful have never been created in most countries in Latin America. Programs are well designed, in theory, well conceived, but when it comes to implementation, failure. Teacher and student evaluations are the other weakest points. Okay, you invest millions. I'm not going to mention any country in particular, but I've done some financial research. Hundreds of millions of dollars spent since 2004 until today in English language learning and teaching public education without results. And when I say results, I mean massive results. Some of you may say, well, in my public school, kids learn English. Oh, but that's one school. Suppose it's 100 schools. But that's not how you measure impact in education. So we have to address the macro of education. If we want to solve the problem at the classroom level, at the teacher level, at the student level, first we have to address the big picture. For that matter, we have the mental level. If we want to improve English language learning and teaching in public education, we have to address this. The contextual factors around English language learning and teaching in public education in Latin America. First of all, starting by the school environment. How much exposure is there to English in the school environment? How much acceptance is there of English language teachers and English language class? Do people actually believe that they can learn English in school? Is there a belief that it is possible? What about the family and the community environment? Do parents Let's think about Colombia. Do parents in Colombia expect their children to learn English in school, in public schools? I'm sure they don't. And that plays a very important role because the family plays a role in learning. What about the region? What is the regional reality? 
Colombia is divided on many different regions, just to take this country as an example. What about the national and international setting? The policy. So we have economical and technological aspects, linguistic aspects, geographical aspects, social cultural aspects, and historical and political aspects. Now, when these programs are designed, do they take these into account? No, they don't. The only thing these programs take, take into account is teacher competence and materials. And there comes what I call, and many people call, educational colonialism. They bring people from other countries, alleged geniuses in education, in English language teaching, because they have a PhD, and they've done it before, and they've written books, and they are consultants. But do they know the local reality? Do they understand the most important factor? Context. The school context in public education in Latin America. Resistance. Is this about English language teaching or learning? No. This is about a macro that you have to attack in a holistic, ecosystemic way. The paradigm they use is basically a fragmented paradigm where you address bits and pieces of the issue, teachers and students. And without a look at this, English language learning in public schools would be hard to address. Because we're talking about human beings, we're talking about families, we're talking about economic realities. When you design a program for public schools, you have to take into account where these children live. Do they live in the city or do they live in the countryside? So what kinds of components do you have? The problem is that most of these programs are one size fits all. They're not customized programs. You want to find a solution to English language teaching and learning in public education? You have to customize a solution. And not even a national solution. You have to address a regional solution. To first understand the people. And then try to design a system. But it's not an education technicality issue. That's the easy part. The hardest part is dealing with this macro. How to address a family, their society, their school reality what they have access to, without that, it is impossible to find a true solution. You might find a few good programs here and there, but come on. I mean, people don't understand the implications of monolingualism in Latin America. Why we have so much poverty, why we have so much unemployment, why we have so much juvenile delinquency, it's all related to this. I'm talking about English in this case, but it's all subjects are mostly the same thing. So, the lack of data from the area, from this area, represents a major concern for most ministries in Latin America. Our research demonstrates that information systems are inefficient in monitoring aspects as essential as the number of teachers and their skills, or number of students of different characteristics taking English classes and their proficiency levels. Our systems, by design, are supposed to be student-centered. But they are not. School curricula in Latin America, they're all supposed to be student-centered. But in practice, in class, in schools, they are not. And that's what we have to seriously and honestly address. So the reason why English is not learned in public schools, is not just English, per se, it's not just the teacher and his training or professional development, that is an individualistic view. What about professional associations? We are TISOL. I represent the Dominican Republic TISOL. And in my country, you know what we do? We go to Congress. We spend more time doing advocacy work than doing teacher training. Why? Because we have a strong certainty that first we have to address the big issues. And then we can go down to the teacher and the student. We have to get the country the government, society as a whole, to understand and support us, ELT. So professional associations have actually assumed a professional development approach. They all work on helping individuals to get better. You have to learn how to teach better, you have to improve your English, you have to learn standards, you have to be certified. <laughs> how is that going to work? An individual? You're not an individual, you're part of a system. I believe that we have to adopt a systemic development approach. 
in professional associations. Getting the whole country on board, not just working with teachers. And this is the view of what we call an ELT systemic growth mindset. If we want English language learning to be learned in public education, we have to adopt this view. We have to see the problem as a systemic problem. We have to think about society, the needs, the holes, the teacher as an individual, of course, the school environment, and students and their families, in how they react to English language learning, in how we, the teachers, also react to it, in how we interact with society. My conclusion, because I only have uh, six more minutes, my first conclusion is, this, is we need, as professionals of English language teaching, to redefine our digital advocacy in Latin America. We can't leave it up to politicians, to ministries of education, to interest groups, to publishers. We are TESOL. We are the teachers. We are the experts. We are the ones inside the schools. TESOL International, for example, does that. Look at this position statement from TESOL International. This position statement on the role of teacher associations and education policies and plans was presented in 2007, and they say, TESOL strongly advocates that authorities at all levels recognize the rights of teachers associations to exist, and that teachers associations be accorded legal status. Furthermore, TESOL urges that authorities encourage the active participation of teachers and their associations in the process of transforming education and in education of planning and policy making. The only thing most teachers in Latin America, including most of the countries I work with, are doing is basically professional development. Until we get to transforming education as a whole and get involved in the planning of education for our countries and get involved in policy making, it will be very hard to address this as a system. And we're talking about, in this country, for example, 8 million kids who go to public education, who are condemned to monolingualism. And that is a serious issue, social, economic, and educational issue. So we the teachers can't expect the government, politicians, policymakers to make decisions. We have to take action, raise our voices technically, and get the country to be aware of what's going on. My second conclusion is that we need more local expertise involved and less educational colonialism. This is not about bringing foreigners to our countries which are great in training. That's just one part of the question. But from what I have read in most countries, most of the solutions brought to public education in Latin America are foreign solutions. Brought by international publishers, consultants, People who don't understand truly the nature of the problem and who have a one-size-fits-all approach. They go from country to country offering programs, making billions, by the way. In the end, no results. <coughs> so we, the teachers in every country in Latin America, are the ones who have to raise our voices and try to provide solutions. And try. And get involved. Because empirical evidence shows that there have been no results. And they end up blaming it on the teachers. When all these programs fail, oh, we don't have the teachers, they don't speak English. <laughs> well, you knew that from the beginning, so what do you do about it? Why don't you address that first before offering a multi-million dollar program? And English in Latin America is a multi-factorial problem. It's not just a teacher issue. I guess that too much attention is paid to the language, the learner, and the learning process, and very little attention <coughs> is paid to the political and contextual factors that affect actual teaching and learning. You want to get things to get better? Focus on this. We need better policies, and we need to be able to impact the system. All the factors in the system, not just teacher learning, and not just student learning, because teacher learning and student learning depend on the context. Finally, we have to think and wonder, we have to reconsider this. Should we continue to just focus on professional development, 
Or should we also advocate for the required conditions for teaching and learning? My conclusion is that this is not an issue of individual professional development. This is an issue of a systemic approach where we all have to come together, teachers, get different stakeholders involved, raise awareness in our country, talk to society, go to Congress, go to the government, go to the teachers' union, because it is the whole country that is actually affected by this problem. My conclusion is that English is not learning Latin America because all these factors are not being well attended to. Thank you very much. comment on another reality that I see in my country and everywhere. I've encountered several authorities, several people from the Ministry of Education who, who actually have said why to study English is just the language of imperialism. We are in a socialist country. Um, you know, turn down the United States. They are, you know, we're not a backyard anymore. Um, that's been scary for, for English teacher, but it's actually um, a reality, at least in my country. People saying English is just the language of imperialism. Okay, we don't want that anymore. Thank you. Uh, what is your country? You say your country is different about Colombia? No, I'm talking about Ecuador. Ecuador. Uh, yeah, but we had a bad president for the last 10 years, so hopefully that will change. All right. But well, that is, that's still the mindset of a lot of people in the Ministry of Education. Their mindset is actually wrong because. First of all, you need to possibly enlighten them and educate them in terms of what English is today. I myself come from a communist education. I was a communist, a socialist all my life. I am a socialist by nature. However, English language learning and English is not the language of the United States, it's not the language of the UK, it's not the language of Canada. English, for example, you put together the United States, Canada, the UK, and they are, they are not today one-fourth of the total number of speakers in the world. China has more students of English than the total number of native English speakers in the world. And China is a communist country. You have almost two billion speakers of English in the planet, and only 400 million are native speakers. You have three times more speakers of English as a foreign language than native speakers. Linguistic imperialism nowadays is impossible because countries like Cuba, China, and many other countries are learning English more than any other country in the world. So, English is not the language of a country. English is a lingua franca. English is a global language. What Latin was in its time, in the Middle Ages, now is English. So in your country, you might have to possibly enlighten them and let them know the numbers about English. Only one third of the speakers of English in the world are native speakers. When they talk about imperialism, are they talking about China? China is imperialistic too now. So that's possibly something they have to understand. There's a lot of populism in education and politics. That's populism. Linguistic imperialism today is impossible. There may be intentions, but it's impossible. Because English is not the language of the US. English is the language of the world. That's, that's possibly one answer to that. Sir? Intercultural education. Absolutely. We're talking about English as an international language. Nowadays, for example, we're talking about global citizenry. We're talking about a global citizen, but from a global approach. Global. Taking the best from the global, but maintaining your local values. We're talking about being a global citizen, not about addressing. I come from the field of critical pedagogy. And in critical pedagogy, we say that culture is not necessarily attached to language, especially when English is now spoken by so many cultures. We're talking about a global culture. So intercultural education is great. It's good for critical thinking. For 
example, in this country, in my country, they say that we provide critical thinking and education. That's impossible. If you don't speak English, nowadays, it's very different to have a critical thinking attitude in life. Because you only have access to a language spoken barely by 4% of the world. Spanish is only spoken by 4% of the people in the planet. So how can you say you're providing critical education or providing critical thinking skills in a country where they only speak Spanish? And the only thing they can listen to or read is only in Spanish. There are so many perspectives and so many views that people who don't speak English are missing, that are never translated into Spanish, or are translated too late. There's not an intention to do it. Wouldn't that position, that point of view, accelerate the digitalization of languages? Why would you say that? Because it is like agglutinating the languages in a certain manner. If we keep in mind the points of view of the different cultures, the history of languages, maybe we are promoting mutual understanding in terms of social, linguistic, and grammatic competences. Well, the thing is that you have one language spoken by most people in the world today as a lingua franca. And it's about basically communication. It's being able, being able not just to understand, but being able to contribute. <coughs> when you want people in Latin America to learn English, it's not about what they're going to consume once they know English. It's about what they're going to be able to contribute. How their viewpoints, for example, your viewpoint, <coughs> can be heard in China, in Russia, because you have a language that facilitates communication. Learning English in Latin America is not about what you are going to get from it. It's about what you can give from it. Well, they ask, they've asked you, uh, anybody else? Yes, sir? Sure. Last question. Yeah, Where this is the last question. question, question, question. question. <laughs> I would like to thank you for your a very compelling presentation. I like it. And uh, just, just a question, not, this, not a question, but I'm going to ask you an advice, because we are all teachers and educators in this plenary. I would like to ask your advice while we are waiting for a concrete solution of the problem. So what do you think we could do as teachers or administrators, you know, to wait or to look for solutions, possible solutions that we have in the country? Right. You are hit the nail on the head. Don't wait for a solution. Take action. You have professional associations here like Columbia Tito, which has great experts, great people, people committed, passionate committed to this. I guess you are the experts in Colombia. You should all come together and release position statements. First step, you want an idea? First step, release a public position statement about teaching and learning English in Colombia to the government and the population. The first step, make it clear. A position statement, stating issues like these, and start bringing people to understand it too. The solution comes from you, from the teachers. Do not expect a solution from policymakers. Do not expect a solution from governments. You are the teachers. You are in the schools. You are the ones who have to come together. The biggest problem, believe it or not, is called learned helplessness. Most people in Latin America live in a mentality of learned helplessness. You feel you are powerless. You feel, there's nothing I can do. It's impossible. This is never going to change. That's exactly what they want you to think. So you have to move to a different mindset. A growth mindset. A mindset of saying, we can do it. Let's come together and become active advocates of English language learning in Colombia. From what I have read and seen, you haven't been the actors involved. You have been the recipient of decisions, but you haven't been able to make decisions. So the first step is try to have incidents. That's my idea. Become active advocates on this issue, and not just passive recipients of any decision or policy. Thank you very much. He has been